Hello, um, I found out about um, an interactive fiction Lovecraftian thing called Horror in the Darkness. Um, that's your, for your phone. And then uh, it got me thinking to when I had a go at some interactive fiction in a previous video. So I thought, that was fun, why don't we do that again? Because uh, I found a whole load of um, like interesting looking ones um, visually stimulating um, on itch.io so let's jump in right this one is called punk char so we can play this Ooh. music How do we get full screen? I must have been about five when I saw the first hole. Old enough to make stuff up, but not too old. Oh, not old enough to lie. Not really. They are among my earliest and surest of memories. I quickly learned not to talk about it. I make it full screen. Never mind. My stories would upset my parents. I didn't know why, but I figured the holes were just one of those things. Like many Catholic kids are sure to learn, there are subjects adults are just not comfortable talking about. And if I had to keep it to myself, so be it. I saw them first out in the garden. That's to say, that's where I was when I saw them. The holes were not in anything. Rather, they seemed like small tears hovering in the space between things. They moved a little when I did. If I moved closer, they seemed to move away. If I turned my head, they seemed to wobble as pebbles refracted in a stream of water. I reached out to touch them. I took a closer look. Oh, I've had choices. I reached out to touch them. I raised my hand out towards a couple of holes and stopped. They faded as I moved in closer, disappearing into the dark leaves of the bushes. I took a deep breath, kept my hand out and closed my eyes. I felt a sharp tingling at the tip of my finger. Fighting the urge to pull my hand back, I slowly opened my eyes and looked at my fingers. I couldn't see anything, and the tingling subsided, replaced by the sudden smell of rotting apples. Startled, I pulled my hand back, gasping for air and too scared to cry. I backed away, keeping my eyes on the holes. I turned and ran out of the garden. Backed away. I reckon backed away. I felt safer when I returned to the kitchen. I closed the door and stared at it for several moments, afraid that turning my gaze from the solidity, solidity of the bright blue painted wood would only reveal more spots. I must have stood like that until my mother found me. I don't remember when I finally looked away. Mm. I reckon that uh, My parents quickly made it clear they had no patience for my nonsense. After that first close encounter, I managed to avoid looking at the spots through most of my childhood. Living with them took effort. After a while, they seemed to give up. When they did turn up, I learned how to handle it. 
sometimes closing one eye or tilting my head just a bit, just like trying to dodge a stray sunbeam hitting your eyes. In time, it felt almost like a game. I might shift in my seat at the dinner table, move my chair for a change of perspective, and I'd see a round black void where my mother's head would be. But I never lingered on them for long. Even the slightest hint of that terrible smell and the game was over. I refused to face that perhaps I wasn't the one playing the game. But that took me years to realise. It was around my 12th birthday. My parents had company. I could hear them downstairs, their laughing and talking, almost drowning out the music. My parents were quiet, apparently just hosts for gossip. I was sitting in my room, too shy to even say hello, and I was certain my parents preferred it that way too. I know the feeling. I was getting hungry. Sneaking into the kitchen, I found it almost empty. Only crumbs on plates and empty bottles. Even the fridge yawned emptily. I hurried past the living room door as I went for the cellar. There might have been some snacks among the cans and preserves down there. I had barely stopped. I had barely stepped off the last step of the stairs when the darkness closed in and I heard the unmistakable click of the brown cellar door closing behind me. It sounded like someone in the living room slowly turned the music down. I grasped for the light switch. I turned and ran back up. Light switch. I felt my way across the wall, my trembling, impatient fingers flicking the switch and flooding the little room with light. I barely had a moment to catch my breath before the thick, revolting smell of rotten fruit filled the room. I turned to see a wide, dark void turning and twisting at the foot of the stairs. My stomach turned, but I kept my eyes on the twisting hole. I tried to back away. I stepped closer. Go on, step closer. With the first step, it was abundantly clear that I no longer had the control over the holes I thought I had. The darkness grew around me with every move, stretching to fill my field of view, falling, sinking into darkness. I woke up in the garden. My head was pounding and I could hardly see. I got to my feet and scrambled for the familiar shape of the blue kitchen door. I grabbed the door handle. Or I tried anyway. I fumbled for a few moments before realising I was grabbing the wrong side of the door. It finally swung open and I stumbled into the kitchen. The strange, mirrored version of the kitchen anyway. Every cupboard, window and door in the room a perfect mirror of what it was. And the room filled with a by now too familiar stench. I cried out for my parents. As my mother opened the door from the living room, little dark motes started swirling at the edges of my vision and that obnoxious music glared out the door. As I looked up, I blinked and squinted at the swirling spots, but nothing could hide that hole where her head should be. I fell onto my back, crawling backwards frantically, and all I could see was her body shrinking from view and that dark head growing and growing. To be continued. Darn it. Seriously. Okay, let's try the tapping. The tapping. Okay. Mm. 
Wake up. You rub your eyes and look around to try to get your bearings. Did you fall asleep? This place is familiar, but it smells wrong. Empty. You put your hand out to raise yourself up off the floor and find paper. Envelopes? A pile of mail has built up inside the door you find yourself next to. Look at the room. It's hard to tell at first what the room is. There's not much in it. It's carpeted with some kind of display cabinet on one side and a brick fireplace surrounded by wood panelling taking up one end of the room. Opposite the cab cabinet, navy velvet floor length curtains hang at the windows. They probably looked expensive at some point but mould and dust have ruined them. A set of double doors sits in the wall between the cabinet and the fireplace. You scruffle to your feet amongst the abandoned mail and try the front door it's been pushed through. Locked. Look at mail, check fireplace, inspect cabinet, look out the window, go through double doors. Let's look at the mail. Some of the envelopes have the crispy feel of paper that got wet at some point and dried. Mould has gotten to some of it. You could try to make out a name, but on every single piece of mail the details are distorted, the ink has run or they are somehow sun faded. How long has any of this been here? Um, look at the room. Oh, I already did that. Check fireplace. Ooh. Distant memory of reading about people hiding things in fireplaces tickles at your mind. Maybe there's a spare front door key here. That would be weird, but maybe. A look in the fireplace reveals it's never seen a real fire in its lifetime. A faint draught whistles down the chimney, but you can't see any light up there. You gingerly poke your hand up and feel around, and a cloud of dry black dust tumbles down, along with more than one spider. You jump back, the spiders run too quickly for you to see through the dust. You brush yourself off and wonder what on earth you were thinking. No key here, only crawlies. Um, cabinet. Kept in cabinets, trapped in cabinets. You open the glass fronted... Oh God, I read that badly. You open the glass fronted doors on the cabinet to get a closer look at the trinkets inside. A white dinner service with silvery gold edging occupies the centre, while the outer shelves hold ceramic, crystal, brass dolphin ornaments, tankards, decorative perfume bottles. It's all very car boot sale. No rare antiquities here and no front door key. I like car boot sales. They are good. Okay, look out the window. Your fingers leave imprints in velvet thick with dust as you pull a curtain aside. It feels kind of greasy. The window looks misted up like condensation, except when you try to wipe it away it doesn't work and just leaves your hands with the same damp, slick feel as the curtains. Light shines in but the outside surroundings are obscured. Um, double doors. The doors click open and you see what must have been a living room. Two sofas sit at right angles facing a TV that sits atop a large cupboard. Wood floor, rug, coffee table, lamp, the usual. A tarnished mirror with an image of a blank-eyed, long-haired woman printed on it hangs on a wall leading to the stairs and you can hear something tapping in a draught from upstairs. Whoever decorated this room clearly likes green. The walls are pale green, the rug is green, the curtains are green, the sofas are green. You can see the kitchen through a wood panelled archway. A small dog sits in the space underneath the stairs. Oh, a dog bed, sorry. Um, open the curtains. These curtains are much less plush than the ones in the front room. Maybe those were to show off to the neighbours. You pull these open to see a heavily rotten window frame to the stage that you wonder how the glass is still in it. 
a large dead moth lies paper-like on the windowsill. Through the glass you see a narrow path, a brick wall and little else. There is no sound from outside. TV cupboard. Oh. The doors take a bit of a yank to open, but eventually they creak and a puff of vaguely familiar scent wafts into your face. You peer in and as your eyes adjust to the darkness, you'd swear that it seems to be bigger on the inside than the outside. It is filled to overflowing with stuff. VHS player, DVD player, a record player, a games console and all the accompaniments, videos, DVDs, CDs, a box filled with 12 inch vinyl records, cassettes, video game cartridges. Is that an old computer at the back? You could probably sell the Mega Drive games to a nostalgic collector, but the records all seem as neglected as the forgotten mail by the front door. Sounds like my friend Steve's house. You kneel down and reach in, grabbing a record box by its handle to heft it out to see if any actual treasures lurk in this hoard. Pardon me. Your hand brushes against something and you swiftly pull it back out. Just a spider web. You look back in and see the occupant of the web you just ripped crawl out from a back corner. It sits on top of the box you were just about to take. Your eyes sense movement from the other corners as dark shapes start to scurry and seep down over the videos. You tumble backwards and kick the cupboard doors shut. Maybe not. I opened the curtains already, didn't I? Go to kitchen. The kitchen is a little grim but unremarkable. Fridge. Did I read this? No. Fridge, cooker, sink, washing machine, tumble dryer, kitchen, table. Cobwebs stick to the layer of grease that coats most things in here. A large window shows the same brick wall outside that you saw from the living room, but you still can't see where the path leads. The back door leading to it is locked tight. Another door lies in the end wall. The smells of cigarette smoke, cooking oil and hairspray linger. There's no electricity, so you don't open the fridge. If there's anything in there, it can stay in there. You risk gingerly opening the cupboard underneath the kitchen sink, wary after the last cupboard experience. Inside, you find nothing but 11 cans of spider-killing spray. It seems like a useful sort of thing to have in this place, so you take one with you. Open the door. You find yourself inside the dampest, mouldiest bathroom you've ever had the displeasure of being in. Whoever chose wood panelling for this room had very poor judgement. It has gone black and slimy, and smells really quite rank. Some kind of flesh-coloured mushroomy fungus, like little disembodied baby's ears, is growing from it in, above the bathtub. There is nothing good here. You leave and close the door tightly behind you. Leave. As you step back from the nasty bathroom door, you see a shadow in the frosted glass of the back door. You freeze and it darts out of sight. However, the handle clicks and the door drifts open. You can see outside and whatever it was seems to have gone and the thought of a breath of fresh air is rather inviting after the bathroom stink. Stepping out onto the path, you see it leads into what was supposed to be a garden. It's completely overgrown with nasturtiums, a waist-height waving pool of green and orange, too thick and tangled to see what's beneath them. Any hope you have of getting out this way is dashed by walls on all sides that are too high to safely climb, and you have no idea if it would be better on the other side anyway. At least in here you've got your spider spray. You wonder if you can see what's over the wall from the upstairs window. You head back inside and start up the stairs into the darkness above. The landing has no windows and all the doors up here are closed. The first door you come to is off level with the others, at a point where the staircase turns around and up to the right. 
the light from downstairs doesn't reach up the ceiling and you're pretty sure you can hear a faint tapping sound from somewhere above you. You hope it is just the sound of the same draught you felt elsewhere in the house. You reach out and give the doorknob a shove. The door doesn't open very far. It seems that something is wedged behind it. It's a wide enough gap for you to get in though. It's cold enough to make you have a little shiver as your eyes adjust to the light and you see hints of a pink carpet, pink walls and pink curtains. You can't figure out what's in here for a second, then realise it is, quite simply, a small mountain of stuff. A wardrobe and dressing table are shoved in behind the door and a pink duvet cover peeks out from a heap of clothes, books, toys, magazines and just general whatever. Ornaments and jewellery are piled onto the dressing table where the smell of stale makeup permeates from an open drawer. Black bags of miscellany fill any gaps on the floor around the heap which builds up in the opposite corner where it is literally taller than you. The window is visible directly opposite you. The wall surrounding it burnt black with a creeping mould that is stretching out to meet the cobwebs dripping from the ceiling. Open the wardrobe on your left. The door opens to what looks like the wardrobe to Narnia. Old dresses, suits, fur coats are squashed in too tightly to get any out without causing another pile of stuff. They're all covered with beige dust from woodworm in the shelves above, which tumbles out on, around your feet from the bottom as well. The mirror attached to the inside of the door reflects the darkness on a landing behind you. Wardrobe on the right. This wardrobe is small, painted white with red handles at some point. You realise from the Care Bear sticker at the bottom that it's a child's wardrobe. It's pretty bare inside apart from one coat hanger full of 60s looking ties and a soft doll dressed like a cute little red riding hood except in pale blue. Her hood slips back to reveal short blonde hair. She seems pretty cool. You've no use for a doll though so you tuck her back into the spot and close the door. Look through the window. You start to make your way through the hoard towards the window, doing your best not to break anything as you go. Despite your best efforts, about three quarters of the way across and thigh deep in squishy black bags, you knock a pile of books, which slide aside and uncover a big old spider. It scuttles a couple of inches towards you and stops, between you and the window. You pop the lid off the spider spray, take aim and fire. The spider recoils and runs up the pile, legs twitching, so you aim higher and give it another spray. Spiders are good though. As it spasms onto its back, you hear the tapping above you again. The pile of stuff starts to slowly tumble down, except it doesn't. That's not stuff moving, it's spiders crawling out from the heap. The cobwebs shimmer as their owners descend towards you and you tumble backwards, spraying everywhere, twitching spiders flailing towards you as you retreat back to the landing, slamming the door shut. If this is a dream, you'd like to wake up now. Up three more steps and you can make out two more doors and little else. The door straight ahead refuses to budge at your touch, so you open the door to your left. The light from inside illuminates the landing enough for you to make out a heavy padlock on the other door, the rust from which has run in the damp in this place, leaving coppery stains trickling to the floor. Grubby handprints suggest someone else tried shoving the door open at some point to no avail. The light reaches up, enough to see an attic hatch with a board nailed over it, some of the nails missing. That tapping noise is more insistent now. Middle bedroom. It's completely empty in here, without so much as a cobweb lurking in a corner. It's the only room without a musty smell, and the white walls are unmarked by the creeping mould present everywhere else. Silence wraps you like a comfortable blanket. The window is obscured by ivy growing over the outside of it, so you still can't see what's outside. 
The room feels light and airy regardless, and you pause for a while to gather yourself. A loud creak from the landing disturbs the silence. Stay in here, return to landing. I think I'm going to stay in here. You don't want to know what made that noise. It sounded bigger than anything a can of spider spray could handle. The tap, tap, tap descends down the other side of the room's wall, and the door moves slightly then starts to open ever so slowly. You run over and push it shut. It bumps against your back as you lean against it, then slide down to the floor and sit with your weight keeping it shut. The tapping behind your head never stops, but it never gets in and you never get out. Oh, well... Blimey! I bet we all pooed our pants, didn't we? Well, that was fun. Yeah, I enjoy doing these. I'll probably... Oh. So yeah, if you go to itch.io, there's lots of them. You should have a go at some... Okay, that's it. Um, I'm going to go and eat now. Goodbye.